Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. As parents, it can be hard to fathom why American students have fallen behind when they seem to constantly be doing homework. My guest saw in her own daughter the mounting stress of an intense workload and pressure to pass standardized tests, something millions of students experience. But she decided to put her angst into action and actually make a documentary about the problem. It's called Race to Nowhere. Vicki Avalese, thanks so much for coming by. I appreciate it so much. You've been very busy doing these screenings really all across the country That's where right. parents primarily come or they're school officials and students, or is it mostly for parents? No, no, we're seeing all of the stakeholders come together. We're seeing communities come together, Katie. And so we screen for parents, for faculty, administrators, school board members, even policymakers are coming. And then we're screening at hundreds of colleges across the country. It's a very so unconventional it, way of kind of rolling out a movie. I know it came out earlier this fall, correct? That's right. But it seems to me that it's actually getting more buzz now that you've been holding these sort of relatively small screenings all across the country. That's right. Well, they're, they're actually large screenings. How Typically, many they come? range from 300 up to over 1,000. So wow. at this point, we've probably shown this film to more than half a million people, which, as documentaries go, puts us right up there in maybe the top 25 documentaries. So, yes, it's an unusual way, but I'm really committed to the change that this film has the power to create, and I think the only way to create that change is to bring communities together and to have the dialogue following the film. So we're not just talking about a film, we're talking about a grassroots movement. And here. we're going to talk more about that movement in a moment, but I first want to talk about the genesis of this project. I mentioned your daughter, but really you have three kids yes. and you were observing the toll that their academic lives uh, was taking on on them and on your whole family. Right? No, that's right. That's right. And so it was a gradual awareness. And so when my kids were younger, I thought that my kids had so many more opportunities than I did growing up. And the violin lessons and the kumon and uh, the homework, it all seemed like a great idea. You and embrace it, that, especially because I think your, your dad had passed away, or is that right? No, 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 my parents were divorced. Your parents, that's right, young. that's right, your parents were divorced. So but you raised. were raised by a single mom and Absolutely. there were four kids. That's correct. And it was hard for her to kind of give you all the opportunities you felt you could give your own kids. Well, right, and that, I mean, I think that experience actually led me to where I am today. You know, um, I became a resourceful person and I knew I wanted to be an independent person. And so those experiences shaped me. Uh, but when I had kids, I wanted to give my kids all the things that I didn't have as a child. And it was only as my daughters got to middle school that I started to see the toll that not only uh, their education was taking, but our larger culture, our competitive, kind of more is better. Our culture. And, and their overscheduled lives exactly. as well. It wasn't yeah. just the academic pressures, Correct. it was the fact that they were incredibly busy doing sports, doing homework, trying to kind of satisfy that resume they were building, uh, right. potentially. I right. mean, maybe unbeknownst to you, but... Right, and there wasn't there wasn't downtime. There wasn't time for our family to spend time together, you know, being outside. Um, we seemed to be on this treadmill, and when one of my daughters became physically sick, caused me to stop in my tracks and ask she what was going on. She had some stomach problems, right? Correct, yes, exactly. And, you know, was waking up in panic attacks, worrying about a test the next day, and this is seventh grade. Um, and as I started talking to parents and to other kids and to teachers uh, in communities all across the country, I realized that um, I was onto something and there was an important story that needed to be told and that we needed to hear it from the people closest to our education system, the students, the teachers, and the parents. And in fact, you, I was going to say, you, I, I was impressed by how geographically diverse mm -hmm. the students were in the film. I mean, you interviewed kids in Indiana, didn't yeah. you, and California. Yeah. Um, uh, New York. Uh, yeah. We were in New Westbury. York. Westbury. Uh, correct. Uh, uh, and, and really Long all Island, yeah. on Long, in Long Island, mm -hmm. um, all over the country. And what was sort of the common refrain you heard? With student after student. Right. With student after student, I think that our competitive, performance-oriented culture and education system is creating a generation of kids who are depressed, anxious, 
uh, and in many cases have checked out altogether that we have such a narrow definition of what a successful young person looks like today and, um, and a one-size-fits-all approach to education. And I think um, many of them see the lack of meaning in their education and in all the extracurricular activities. They're always looking to the next step rather than being present. And one of the things, I mean, there were many aha moments yeah. for me where I thought, wow, uh, is that these kids aren't really learning. One of the many shocking things I heard in your documentary, and I think it might have been the woman from Stanford, I'm not sure who was saying this, but all these kids are working so hard to get in top-notch schools. Right. And then when they do, so many of them have to be remediated. In other words, they've taken all these AP classes, right. they've done incredibly well in school, they've done great on their standardized tests, or certainly yeah. well, and yet they get to college and they haven't retained anything. What That's is right. that telling you about the way we're teaching our kids? Right, so I mean, we have a quantity-driven model, I think, because we're so fearful as a society as to what the future holds for our kids and whether they'll be able to compete in the global economy, that our approach has been to do more of what we've always done. And what we're seeing is young people who are memorizing for a test, regurgitating, and then moving on to the next thing. And then it we're evaporates in about two weeks, right? Well, right. In fact, one of the students yeah. said that. Well, and you know what, and I was at a screening last night night and it hit home, there was a student who spoke up about the fact that he asked to teach a freshman class next year during his senior year. And when he started quizzing his classmates who are now juniors on the material they covered as freshmen, they didn't remember any of it. And so we're focusing on the wrong things and we're not developing critical thinking skills. I think our schools in many cases are taking the creativity out of our children. And those are the skills that are going to serve them in the long term. So what are, what are they focusing on? Just rote memorization, kind of just regurgitating facts? and figures and dates? Well, I think in a lot of cases that's absolutely the case and I think that our teachers are under tremendous pressure both because of the standards and the AP program to cover such volumes of content. And, you know, we need to remember we're in the post-information age. So much information is available to our kids. Of course we want them to have some core knowledge, but it's really what do you do with that knowledge? Are you able to think? Are you able to solve problems? And I think one of the scary things to me is that we're also um, stigmatizing making mistakes right now in our education system and that's a huge problem because and that's driven kids to cheat that's I mean, right. there's so much to talk about or in to this take documentary. the performance medications oh right? to, I mean, to, to take Adderall so they can focus better so they can stay up late and stay focused exactly well I, oh, so I have so much to talk to you about but one <laughs> one question I wanted to ask you is where do you think Vicki this pressure is coming from is it coming from parents is it coming from teachers is it coming from college admissions mm -hmm. People, I, I is it coming from the students themselves? Um, is it coming from just being in a in a highly charged competitive environment? Well, I think that it's coming from being in a pressure cooker culture for starters. And I think that the pressures are coming from a lot of places. Absolutely, we as parents have contributed to this huge issue. College admissions drives this. I think our media drives this in terms of the fear that How? our country is falling oh, behind. Oh, I see, and, yeah. and then you've got rankings of all of our schools and the sense that you have to find the best school, right? It's really about a fit. And it's really about what does your child do at that school, whether we're talking talking about high school or college. And so I think there are a lot of forces coming together. And then there's the policies, right? Um, and you can go back to 1983 and a nation at risk. Um, the no child left to, behind. No child left behind and now race to the top. Where um, standardized tests are the indicator of how students are progressing and are linked to federal funding for that particular right. school district or state. Well, right, and the idea that we're competitively allocating resources, I think is a very bad idea. And if you look around the world, there isn't another country that is approaching education in this way. Well, this this is brings me to my next question. So I get this, this DVD and I'm yeah. thinking, okay, I spent so much time talking about the fact that our kids are 31st in the in the, in the world right. in terms of our math and science skills um, among developed nations, right. that we're falling so far behind, we're not globally competitive, and you know, this is what you hear time and time again. Right. So, and then your documentary focuses on how we're putting too much pressure on kids, they're yeah. doing too much homework. Can both things be true? Because well, I was trying to kind of 
integrate these two notions, and I was having a hard time doing that. Right. So I think there are a few things going on. First of all, with respect to the test scores, our test scores have never been good. If you go back all the way to the 60s, our test scores have never been good as a country, and yet we've led the world in innovation and creativity. At a recent screening, Deborah Stipek, who's in the film, had seen the film for the first time and spoke on a panel and said she just came back from China, where they have very high test scores, and the educators Shanghai there... in particular. Exactly. And she said the educators there are looking at what what we used to do here because they see those high test scores and that very narrow way of training young people isn't leading to the talented, uh, the talents that they need. It's not leading to the innovation, the creative thinking, the problem solving, the ability to work collaboratively. And I think that, so we also have to look at the fact that many kids in this country were in a much more diverse country than a lot of the countries were compared to. And many of our communities aren't given the same resources. We have a number of students who are English as a second language. And um, so I think there are a lot of different factors. Uh, one book that comes to mind is Catch up or leading the way, and it's uh, Young Zhao's book. It's the very same thing that Deborah Stipek says. At the very time, his thesis essentially is at the very time we're looking to go in the direction of more testing, our Asian counterparts are looking at what we used to do here, focusing on the whole child and the social and emotional learning and all of the skills that are going to carry their kids, you know, into the future. I thought you have one profile that that's very poignant, and the teacher gets quite emotional. She, I think, she went to UC Berkeley and got a yeah. joint. Uh, degree right. in teaching and a master's, I believe, Correct. right, at the same time in her, her teaching certification. And I think she left the teaching profession because she was so frustrated that that she wasn't able to, to focus on things like critical thinking and that she had to teach to the test. Right. And it was a source of tremendous frustration for her. Did you hear that from teacher after teacher? Yeah, and we continue to hear that. The teachers are under tremendous pressure. And I think this film is giving educators permission to add their voice to the dialogue around education reform. But I also want to say this isn't just about our education system. I think our schools are a microcosm of our larger culture. And, um, and we've just gotten so afraid. Uh, so, yeah, we do hear that, though, from teacher after teacher, that they're under tremendous pressure to teach the tests, and not just because of the policies, but you've also got the AP program, and that's driving the college admissions, and then, you know, they're accountable to the parents, and the parents are also looking for simple ways to measure their schools and to make sure that things are going okay. Well, well, not, not, to, not to rain on your parade or anything, <laughs> Vicki, but how do you measure students' progress? I mean, it's all nice to say, you know, we want to teach our kids to be innovative and creative right. and critical thinkers. But I mean, realistically, doesn't there have to be some way to measure if a student's getting from point A to point B and making true academic progress and, in fact, is learning and retaining the information they're being taught? Well, of course, and our educators are always assessing our children. On a daily basis, they're doing that. And I think we as parents are assessing how our kids' education is progressing. And we need to just remember that it's not all about the test. What we're advocating for is a much more balanced approach and that there not be high stakes attached to these tests because I think when you have high stakes, you run the risk of um, cheating and gaming the system, if you will. But, but aren't more colleges, you know, it's interesting because I watched this with a friend of mine who has four kids. And she was saying that the, the new head of her, her daughter's school, her three or older, but her daughter is in ninth grade, he got rid of all AP classes. They don't exist. And this is a very competitive, yeah. private, New York area school. Yeah. Um, are you seeing a trend towards, towards that happening? I can't imagine that happening at my daughter's school. I just can't. Yeah. Right. But um, We are, are seeing a trend. Absolutely. And, and because I, I know that colleges are also putting less emphasis on some colleges, mm -hmm. not all, right. on the SATs, right? That's right. There are hundreds of colleges that are moving away from the SATs or making them optional and really looking for the individuals. And I think even, you know, the name brand schools, we recently screened for Stanford's admissions department. And there were many, um, many tiers in that room um, and a really great dialogue afterwards. But what they're seeing is the applications they're getting. They have so many APs, they don't even look at that anymore. They're looking for passionate people on the and other passionate hand, learners. Yes. On the other hand, when my nephew was applying for college, I remember he told me, and he was applying to go to a, a state mm -hmm. university, and mm -hmm. he said, they won't even look at you 
if you don't take AP classes at this school. Right, so that to me is one of the advantages of this film. When you bring communities together, if you bring the educators, the administrators, and parents together and they work collaboratively, they can make a decision to move away from the APs. And those schools that have eliminated the AP program, it's not to say they've lowered the bar, but they've freed the teachers up and the students from being taught to a test. And in that way, they can go with student interest, dig much deeper, and those kids are still getting into the same fabulous universities that the high schools with the AP program. But if you have AP classes in a high school and you choose not to take them, well, let's right. say you, you get an A and you don't take AP math, which mm -hmm. makes me break into a cold sweat at the very thought of it, but right. I could never take AP math. And let's say I got an A plus in regular math right. and I would have gotten a C in AP. There are a lot of schools, if I were in high school still, a lot of colleges would say, well, yeah, okay, she did well in regular math, but she didn't take AP. We don't want her. I mean, right, that's but true. I think they're really looking at the whole person. I do. I think there are many colleges who wouldn't take that approach. And I think that, you know, when it comes to APs, what I tell my own kids, you know, pursue those if it's something you're passionate about and you really want to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. um, so but pick I think a we couple need to, of APs. You don't have to be in five AP classes. If you have a kid who is an AP student and the APs are offered at your school, I can tell you at one of my daughter's school, there are very few APs offered and uh, very few students who are even allowed to take the APs. I mean, we have more students than ever taking those AP classes and more students than ever failing them. And if you look at the data, the data shows that taking those AP classes isn't better preparing our kids for college and the level of work that's required in college. So I think we need our college professors to add what they're seeing in the college you know, at the colleges in terms of remediation, as you referred to before, the thinking skills, the ability to work collaborative. We need to hear from employers who are saying they're seeing the long-term impact of this very narrow way that we're training young people. We need our medical professionals to add their voice. We need our teachers as the professionals in the education world, our child development experts. And I think it's going to take a village to really bring about the change that will lead to better outcomes for kids, better outcomes in terms of health and education. And less stress in the process. You know, I know and you- And more family time. Yeah, I know you interviewed this woman from UC Berkeley. I think she was an admissions person. Oh, Naima, right. But it, I thought it was interesting because she admitted that she was probably contributing to this frenzy. You know, she was talking to a group of students, telling them to take, you know, all these tough courses and really, really achieve so that they'll be considered the top, top tier of right. the applicants. But I didn't get the sense that she thought there was something really wrong with this. Right. Oh, no. Well, she actually left um, UC Berkeley, and she did think there was something very wrong. Oh, she wrong. did. I think she film, was really I did, struggling. I mean, I, th I thought she was struggling, but I thought, you know, I thought she was questioning her role, but I didn't get the sense that she thought things really needed to change. No, but I, I guess think she's she moved. did. Absolutely, she did. And I think about something that one of the teachers said in the film, which is that we are teaching the majority of our kids as if they were all in the top 2%. Well, that's and there is a bell curve. Well, that's, I thought that was interesting, too. So the question is, you know, when I was in school, there were A students, there were B students, right. and there were C students. Right. And, of course, there were some that weren't as good as that right. who, who really did struggle, you know. And... And it seems to me that we, that everybody is trying to be an A student now, and everybody is expected in a weird That's way true. to be an A student now. So, and if you're not, then your self-esteem plummets or you just feel really terrible about yourself. Well, and I think that's the majority of our students because there's so much great inflation and pressure to be at the top. I think it's very easy to see why a number of kids think they don't measure up and their coping strategies are just different and they check out. And so I think we need to remember as parents and as educators that kids come to the table, they're intrinsically uh, motivated to learn and we take it away from them when we ask them to do things that are either developmentally inappropriate or things for us as the adults in their life. We really want to remember, I mean, think about a child who learns how to crawl and walk and talk. They do that not because we make them, right? Uh, but they're motivated to do that. And I think when you think about young kids in kindergarten, they're so enthusiastic about school and the longer they're in school, we're starting to see that go away. But, you know, sometimes my daughter calls, call, once she called me from college, just distraught that she'd gotten a B on a paper. And all her, her, some of her friends were like, oh, I'm so sorry, you got a B. And I was like, are you kidding me? You know, I think right. that, that some of these kids are, have worked so hard or so used to, to getting great grades that when they don't, they, it's hard. They, they have a difficult time coping and dealing with that disappointment. And That's right. certainly the most poignant and heartbreaking story in your film is about a 13-year-old girl named Devin. Right. 
and your close friends, I understand, with her family, her parents. This just broke my heart. Yeah. This little girl, uh, outstanding little girl, which, by the way, it doesn't matter whether she was outstanding right. or not. Can I just say no, that? No, that's right. She uh, did poorly in a math test, got an F, mm -hmm. uh, AP math, right? Right. And she ended up taking her own life. Right. And, and I mean, this is happening more and more. In fact, you say right. in the documentary that kids are killing themselves. Well, you know, and just last night I was in New Jersey at a screening and the parents I spoke to after that screening were talking about how close to home this was for their community where they've suffered several suicides just last fall. And, you know, it hit home close to me last week to hear one of my daughter's um, friends who also performed poorly on an exam and began um, engaging in some really unhealthy coping mechanisms or strategies, um, if you will. I think that we have to look at, suicide is a very complicated issue and we need to look at the very unhealthy culture that exists in many of our schools. And we need to remember that our teenagers, their bodies and minds are still growing and developing, and it's the wrong time to give them our unbalanced, unbalanced adult lives. Um, they need the time and the space to develop uh, all of the skills that are going to serve them for the uh, long term. One of the interesting things you talk about, and I want to get to some, some I, I got some really good questions on, on my Twitter account. I tweeted I last that. night that I, that I really um, thought this was an important movie. But before I talk to, you, talk to you about homework and right. the amount of homework and the amount of homework other countries are giving their kids, which I thought was really fascinating, let's take a look. We have a clip from the documentary, and okay. then we'll talk some more. Okay. I had a student that had a 3.5 GPA, got accepted into um, uh, St. Mary's College, which is around here. She didn't pass her exit exams, and, and they told her she couldn't graduate. Y you can't just take this one thing and say, it's all over because it's one thing. And when you start to do that to people, the stress level is going to go up because little things count. There was a time when, when a Casey was coming up in February, I was crying my eyes out, man. Because I was thinking if I failed a Casey, I might flunk the grade. With all the pressure on test scores, instead of giving kids a chance to do art or another interesting class, we make them take two math classes. We don't have time for projects anymore. We don't have time to measure the obesity rate in this community and do sort of an integrated project on, you know, what that means because that takes too long. So things that actually get our students to think and work together and care are pushed aside. That teacher talked about the fact that sort of project education, I mm -hmm. guess, sort of an integrated educational experience that whole method has been abandoned. Is yep. it, did you find that to be the case That's in true. schools across the country? Well, there are a handful of schools that are moving more in the right, what I see as the right direction, which is project-based learning and integrated studies. When you think about the typical high school day and our kids are taking five to seven classes, their day is really fragmented, and then they come home in the evenings to five to different, seven different classes to prepare for the next day. And um, I think that when we think about the pressures our kids are under and the educational outcomes, we want to think about how how can we create schools where kids actually want to be there, where the learning is engaged and meaningful and relevant to their lives? And then I think we'll see stress levels go down. We're not saying lower the bar. We need to work smarter. You know, you, you talk about your son, Zach, who's so <laughs> cute and this, with his red hair. And, you know, uh, I guess they, he didn't get homework one day right. uh, or one night after school. And, you know, you saw that he enjoyed school so much more when he didn't have sort of this homework hanging over his head. A lot of this documentary is about the level, the quantity of homework that we're seeing our kids given, which as a, a mother of a ninth grader, I can attest to uh, a, my daughter who sometimes pulls all-nighters. I'm like, you're in ninth grade. Right. You're not in college. What in the world are you doing staying up all night studying right. or getting, getting maybe two hours of sleep? See, and I didn't do those all-nighters until law school, and so I don't understand. And in our house, sleep is protected. And so even my daughter, who's a junior, she's in bed by 1030 or 11, and she knows that she performs better at school the next day. She's more engaged with her classes. What if she's not done with her homework, or no, what if she doesn't really feel creative. ready for a test? She deals with it. I think she has come to learn that a good night's sleep is worth an awful lot on that test. And, 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 and if she, out if she doesn't do done. as well on the test, is she okay with that? She's okay with it. Really? I'm okay with it, really. I, I think that, yes, I'm they're okay surrounded with it. by it's a culture. It's just trying to get the kids to be okay with it. That's part of the problem. Well, you can say, 
just do your best, right. get a good night's sleep. Right. This is insanity. Yes. But it's sort of like it, well, there's no talking to them. Well, it's in the water they drink in a way, right? I mean, they're surrounded by it. And we're kind of raising this generation to think that they have to be perfectionists and that they have to be good at everything. You know, I think we've sold them this big lie. In, in my home, my kids know that it's okay to get a B. It's okay to get a C. And we want them to make those mistakes now while they're in our homes and we can support them if needed, rather than when they get to college and they fall apart over a B. Or beyond where you or, say right. they're, they become accustomed to tutors and coaches that right. they can't, that they, they have to achieve a certain level and they can go to any lengths necessary to do that, either with a tutor right. or, uh, you know, staying up all night. Uh, or, or taking the medication. Or cheating. Well, right. I mean, that's one of the issues I'm most concerned about also. It's not just the health issues, but the integrity issues. And uh, A lot of know. kids are cheating because they do what they have to do to make good oh, grades. Oh, right. Th that's right. They do what they have to do to get through the quantity also. It's not just about getting the grades, but I think when we're giving them busy work and things that lack meaning and it's 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, yeah, they, they do what they need to do to get through it. And I think, frankly, in many cases, the adults are looking the other way. And so, um, you know, I wonder how much of this is part of our American culture also, that just do what you need to do to get where you need to be. You interviewed a woman named Sarah Bennett, who's the founder of Stop Homework. Um, has she had much success? I know you mentioned, was it a school in Wyoming, Vicki, or yeah. that, that you mentioned sort of as a pilot program, yeah. got rid of homework, and it was so successful? They have no homework at that school? That's right. Now, that's an elementary school. But, right. there, well, but this film is inspiring lots of schools to take a look at the homework. And what I think is important is that we look at quantity as well as the quality of the homework and that we look at the research on homework. And the reality is the research is very clear that in elementary school, there's no benefit to the homework. And in fact, you see detrimental consequences. Reading for pleasure drops off. Family dinners drop off. Those are the two things that actually work well for young children. And didn't one of the experts say that after an hour, uh, an, uh, you know, an hour of homework, what did she say we about that? We start to the, see the unintended time? consequences. After an hour in middle school, you start to see unintended consequences. Kids who start resenting the schoolwork, um, kids who become disengaged with the learning, kids who are sleep deprived, depressed, anxious. Um, bored in some cases, and in high school that number is two hours. I think, you know, I'm a lawyer by background, so I think about the labor law sometimes. I mean, why is it okay for our kids to put in 15-hour days when we would never let them work um, those kind of hours? And, and so how many hours of homework is the average, say, middle and high school student getting in this country? Well, I, I think is that's a, a hard to... number to get your arms around. Uh, but, you know, from the screenings that I've attended, I'm going to tell you in middle school, there are lots of kids who are doing two to four hours of homework. And, and I, then in high on school? On top of a seven or eight hour day in school. Right? Not and to mention extracurricular school, school, activities. Correct, all the extracurricular activities. And that's why sleep is the first thing to go. And yet we have to be concerned about the long-term health consequences of that sleep deprivation. I think that we got an interesting uh, tweet from uh, Wendy. She said, saw race to nowhere, outstanding and terrifying. Is this a national phenomenon or happening primarily in high income areas? That's a great question. And so we are screening the film. One, we filmed in communities, as you know, um, from urban communities to suburban communities. And we found that these issues cross economic lines. We're screening all the time in urban communities. Just last week, I was in West Oakland. And um, they also are feeling the same pressures. They may be coming from different places. And then communities like that have all the real world pressures on top of it. But what we're seeing is the unhealthy coping mechanisms and kids who are checking out of school. And, and you know, so it was interesting because some of the moms in, in more urban areas or lower income areas, yeah. you know, the, the desire for their kids to do well to have is a so life. strong, to Absolutely. have a better life. And you, you spent a lot of time profiling a young African-American uh, student who I thought Isaiah. was, he did so well in middle school and then he fell off in high school so much and it was really tough for him and he was struggling a lot. Then I thought it was great that he worked at that radio station. And that's right. And that sort of has been a savior for him, right? Absolutely. But and look but, at all the life skills that he's learning. I mean, there's a kid who's talking about, you know, all kinds of things on the radio. He's got the life skills that are going to carry him forward, but he started to feel like a failure in high school and consider dropping out. And, and I wonder and so, why high school was so hard in middle school. He got straight A's in middle school. Right. And then he really started to have a tough time. And I wondered 
what was it uh, about high school or how well, could I, think I wanted school, to help him? <laughs> I know. Well, me too. One of the things in high school, I think there's the, you know, college is looming in the distance and there's so much emphasis on how are you going to get ready for that college application and for kids in communities like Oakland, there's also the financial piece and so they want to be able to apply for the scholarships. And so his counselor was advising him to take AP classes that frankly weren't in areas of strength. And right, so, and th then there was that Asian girl who was also saying how much pressure it is for her because not only did she have her schoolwork, but she had the applications for all the scholarships. It's right, just and so many of much those pressure. kids are also working on top of it, right? Right. They, they have to work for, for yeah. financial reasons, which I actually think is a good thing, and many of our young people in suburban communities would benefit if there was a time for that. I mean, I had jobs growing up. I know, but who would and, have time for that if you have to be active in extracurricular activities? As that one girl said, who I thought was so cute, she said the worst word you can hear from an adult is and. Yeah. I'm very involved in student council and yeah. I play the piano and, right. you know, I do this. And she said it's never enough. And then they say, well, you should do more community service. I mean, I just be so the whole well, So it's going to take all of us. I mean, as a culture, we're going to need to shift our mindset. Just recently at the screening at Stanford, Deborah Stipek said, you know, it's not going to be the experts who solve this problem. It's going to be ordinary people parents, educators, students working together, really shifting the mindset around what makes for a healthy childhood, what makes for a good education. And did I mention that the, the countries and, the, and that um, where they do better than the U.S. in standardized tests, did I mention they, this already? They give their kids less homework right. than the, they do in the United States. So. so there are many countries, and I think it was Denise Pope in the film who spoke about the fact that many countries that give less homework are actually outperforming us on those tests. So Which is so extent, interesting. I mean, if you want to be globally competitive and, and, mm -hmm. and do well on these tests, then maybe homework isn't the answer, right? Exactly, exactly. And doing more of what we've always done isn't the answer. And I think one of the countries that comes up often is Finland, where kids aren't even starting school in Finland until they're seven. Educators are valued as professionals in that country. They're developed as professionals. They don't spend all of their time with the kids. They actually collaborate with uh, their colleagues. Uh, there are developmentally appropriate expectations, and those kids aren't tested until they're applying for college. Let me ask you a couple more more Twitter questions, okay. if I could, Vicki. One, one good question is, I don't know the answer to this, how can parents find the balance between having high expectations mm -hmm and not stressing their kids out? I think you need to see the kid in front of you. And um, we all want to have high expectations of our kids, but I think it's important that those high expectations are developmentally appropriate. And we need to you know, ask ourselves, is 20 hours a week or 15 hours a week for a fourth grader in soccer outside of school, is that developmentally appropriate? Because of course we want to have high expectations, but I think we need to look at who's driving those expectations and are they appropriate for your particular child. Another question is, um, too cold doc. <laughs> Too, candles too are cool. Oh, I too saw cold that. Doc. Did you see that? <laughs> I, um, I ask how many top 100 college admissions people have seen commented on issues raised in the film. It, you know, you said you've been having some screenings so we've screened at colleges. We've at over 100 colleges and universities. We've screened for admissions departments, college professors, mental health uh, professionals at these colleges. And this film is resonating for them. They're seeing the mental health fallout the college campuses. They're seeing the kids who have very poor coping skills, who fall apart when things don't go well. Um, and they're also seeing the young people who don't have the thinking skills, the problem-solving skills that are needed in college. And so I think it's going to take all of us working together. But what I want to say to that person is, as parents, we need to not wait on the college admissions process to change, to make changes that better serve our kids today. And as educators, and that's why I go back to these community screenings are so important, because when you get everyone in a community together in the room, all acknowledging this huge, huge epidemic. It's much easier to work in partnership and make changes that work for kids today, and the college admissions will take care of itself. You, you have to remember, it's not the name of the college that's going to determine but your so kids' path in, in life. I mean, look at the people oh, who are running our companies. Oh, a lot of mediocre companies. people graduate from Ivy League colleges Absolutely. and universities, and as you point out, and I've always told people this, uh, you know, most CEOs in this country actually went to state schools. Right. And, uh, or they I got, were C students. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, you, you, I don't think it's fair to use Bill Gates because he dropped no, out of not. Harvard for two right. years, after two years and just spent all his time figuring out probably. computer programming. But I right. thought, you know, you, you mentioned Richard Branson who never went to college. I think there's another CEO who never went to college. I mean, so right. I think what your point is that, that, that young people aren't 
learning sort of emotional intelligence and how to how to problem solve and how to negotiate and how to work with other people and the because what they're learning is just sort of as I said this rote memorization and not even conceptual right. learning right they're right. just learning kind of things and I remember when my daughter was studying for a science test you know we were talking about erosion or something and she kind of was repeating word for word what the words on her notes and I said, well, let's talk about erosion or let's talk about the plane of a mountain or a hill that creates erosion and let's just talk about the concept of it because it, it's not going to help you if you're just memorizing the sentence in your notes. If you don't really understand what it's all about, then there's no point. Right. You know, but, but I think that's what kids are doing. And, and that's what they're being trained to do. I mean, my little guy, Zachary, came home last week and there was something that he asked me to quiz him on and I asked him about it just as you did. And he said, you know, I asked that question to my teacher, and he said, you don't need to know that, just memorize what's here. And so, really? Wait, I don't want to Did blame the teacher. Did you call that teacher? <laughs> well, I, you know, <laughs> I, that, that's a fine line for me at this point, particularly at his school, and at where I am a big advocate. But Right. You know, the they high must do they run when they see you coming up to school? <laughs> <laughs> no, not exactly. I mean, I think that everybody knows this isn't working. It's not working for many of our kids in any of our communities, and that's why it's so important that we have to start having the dialogue. You know, I don't have all the answers. I'm just a really passionate parent about these issues, but as we screen across the country, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of people are coming together and, and at first at least acknowledge acknowledging that this problem exists, and that's going to be the first step. And it's not that complicated, Katie. It's not global warming. We don't need technology to solve it. We need to stop being so afraid, and we need to create the political will to change what we're doing. I know a big theme of your documentary, and we're almost out of time, but is the fact that children are being robbed of their childhoods because they're being programmed to be producers or to have, you know, to resume build from a very, very early age. But I think the uh, tiger mother would disagree with that, right? I mean, it must be interesting for you to hear her perspective, although that's created its own sort of uh, you know, a tempest in a teapot well, in so terms of educating. I mean, so you must have read that and or I did. read about it. No, no, it. I read her book. And it's you must sad. have thought, wow, wait, this is just adding to the pressure. No, no, no. What I thought was, well, that was me. 10 years ago, and it backfired, just as it did for her with one of her kids, right? And her thesis flies in the face of all of the research around education, around healthy development of people. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we trying to create? People who conform and fit this very narrow mold, or do we want independent thinkers and healthy adults, healthy young adults? And I think, again, I'd just go back to um, the antithesis of her book would be Young Zhao's book on catching up or leading the way. And, you know, he's got the research behind it, and we see that that method doesn't work in the long run. Have you thought about um, taking this to Arnie Duncan? who, of course, is overseeing Race to the Top or anybody else in the administration to talk with them about sort of this different way of looking at education? Well, they're, they're aware of this film, Katie. We, we had a call last summer from the U.S. Department of Education. The White House is aware of this film. But I think that what's going to get this film and the dialogue in front of those people and those groups uh, is going to be the support at the grassroots level. When we get hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of parents and educators demanding change and adding their voice and changing the dialogue around education reform in this country, then I think we'll absolutely be taking the film to Washington, D.C. We're working right now on a screening on the Hill. We didn't have time to talk about sort of the whole new media world of texting and being on the computer. That's oh. probably a whole... It's a huge different, challenge, a different you know? show and, and, and subject area because I've been reading, I've been fascinated about right. what is this doing to brain development, what is it doing to, abil you know, our ability, ch our children's ability to concentrate just, and to, to stay, to, focused. To stay oh, yeah. focused and all those things. And I think more and more research is coming out that it's harder to make decisions, that it's it's very, very difficult right. to, absolute, to, to actually absorb the information you're learning because you're so distracted by, I can't there I couldn't, when I was in college, I couldn't listen to music and do homework because I my brain couldn't. So I'm I would the same be too way. busy listening that, to right. the oh that's a beautiful movement, and then I would try to be focused on my history, and I just couldn't do it. So I don't know how these kids 
can learn while they're focused on so many things. Their brain is so fragmented. Right, and so I would just say two things to that. It's a very complicated area, one that's really important as parents. And I they think should it's study it more, that we think? model it, and I think it's really important that we teach our kids and our schools teach our kids at a young age that multitasking actually doesn't really work for most of us. Teach them about the brain research in this area, the addiction that comes out of the computer use, and then we have to model that behavior ourselves and pull ourselves away from the computers at night. Because they say uh, the flashing red light on a BlackBerry actually increases the dopamine in your brain. Right. And how about all those kids who take their Blackberries to restaurants and they're under the table? <sighs> like, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. And they're not, right? Because <laughs> I tell my daughters, put that thing away. Absolutely, because it's you want so your kids rude. to be able to have a conversation someday. Right. right? I mean, exactly. And so they're missing out on those basic skills if they've always got that screen in front of them. But I, I think if we teach them at a young age about those things, it's, uh, it makes a bigger impression. Well, it's so, a part of having good manners, I think. You have to oh incorporate gosh, it into sort of talking to your kids about how to behave and, That's right. you know, decorum and all that other stuff. Right. Well, um, I, I again, I could talk to you all day about this stuff because I really found it so fascinating and so important. I guess my final question is to you, you know, you talk about sort of rethinking our, our what we believe is success in our culture. And I thought, okay, I mean, is yeah. that too deeply entrenched, though? I totally agree with you 100%. It is. That's why we should be valuing people who are social workers and helping right. needy kids or, or valuing teachers more and elevating them. Absolutely. But are our concepts of what is successful so deeply entrenched? I think even someone in the, in the documentary said success is based on how much money you make. Yep. I mean, to change that, with all due respect, I mean, how do you really do that in our culture right. that seems to prize, you know, your your financial uh, situation above all else, sadly? Right, right. Well, so I think, again, this film is helping to change the mindset. I don't think you can watch Race to Nowhere in a community setting and have that dialogue after without leaving with your mindset around childhood and what's important in life. Um, changed and that's what we're hearing and we're seeing people come back multiple times to see the film and I think it is beginning to shift and you're right as adults it's tricky to shift that mindset but I think when you look at children I mean as parents what do we want first and foremost we want our kids to be healthy and happy and so and nice maybe it, good oh, people good people <laughs> actually right generous compassionate people um, and so I think that maybe while we have some work to do on the adults going to be a little bit easier to say we need to redefine what success and achievement means for our young people because there are a lot of unintended consequences in the way that we're approaching this right now. And, well, you know, it's not working in terms of health outcomes. It's not working in terms of educational outcomes. And it's too important. And, and really, at the end of the day, this isn't that complicated. There are many child development experts and education experts who have been talking about these issues for years. And I think this film is finally giving parents permission um, to share their stories and to say this isn't working and we've had enough. And it's great that you're stimulating these conversations at screenings all over the country. And maybe you'll do one at my daughter's school. I would love to. That would I be would great. Maybe you'll come. So I would love that. Vicki Igles, thank, thank you so much. The, the documentary is called Race to Nowhere, which is taken from one of the students who said, sort of use that expression to describe sort of the hectic pace of his life. I think it's really interesting, really important. And and. And thanks so much for coming by to talk to us about it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And by the way, thank you all for watching and for tweeting your questions. I tried to get to some. I didn't get to all of them, but there were some that were very similar to the ones I asked. And remember, you can see all the episodes of this web show anytime at CBSNews.com. Meanwhile, I'll see you later on the CBS Evening News.